Hi, I'm John Woodward. Welcome back to the second lesson in the introduction for For Me to Live as Christ. You've got mail. In this introduction, we're going to read you another letter about the main points in this lesson and hope that it will help us prepare for our Bible study and our discussion time together. All right. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, welcome back to our study as we will be learning about how to get rid of our old unspiritual identity. You see, each of us live in a way that corresponds with how we perceive ourselves, our identity. Many feel stuck with a perceived identity, or they may have an artificial false identity that's based on personal achievements in business or education or religious activity, or one that they have built for themselves. Let's consider a New Testament character as an example of this issue of letting go of an old identity and accepting a new identity by faith. I like to think about Mary Magdalene. Her natural identity was evidently based on where she lived, Magdala, which was a town on the eastern, rather the western shore on the Sea of Galilee. So she became known as Magdalene. In Luke 8, 2, we learn that Mary had been demon-possessed. In fact, God delivered her from seven demons. In a popular novel and film, she was fictionally reinterpreted as a romantic interest of our Lord, which was a blasphemous falsehood. Some have mistakenly identified her as the sinful woman who anointed the feet of Jesus in Luke 7:37, which is not the case. In a similar way, you may have based your identity on where you grew up or on harmful episodes in your past. Others may have misunderstood you and wrongly labeled you. In this lesson, we see how our old identity was linked to our unsaved condition in Adam. Maybe you haven't taken, haven't taken seriously the historicity of the book of Genesis, the personal role of Adam and Eve. By the way, one agenda of the theory of evolution is to discredit Genesis, especially chapters 1, 2, and 3. It seems that skeptics perceive even more clearly than many Christians how the fall, Adam and Eve's fall into sin in Genesis 3, is inseparably linked to the plan of redemption in Christ. However, Genesis is the vital book of beginnings, and it is confirmed by our Lord Jesus himself. God's creation of all things, including the original parents of the human race, is clearly affirmed in Genesis and the New Testament. So we will examine verses such as these. This is in Romans 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man, that's Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And 1 Corinthians 15, 22, which says, For as in Adam all die, whereas in Christ all shall be made alive. As we recognize the desperate condition all people have in their fallen, unsaved state, we learn that sin has a drastic penalty, death, spiritually, physically, and eternally. This condemnation, though, sets the stage for God's great rescue plan. Since we could not deliver ourselves by any religious or speculative philosophy, God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. 1 John 4, 9. In this study, we are reviewing the basic content of the gospel. We cannot begin to speak of experiencing the Christ-centered life if we are not certain that Christ is in our life as our Lord and Savior. We can have this confidence because salvation is based on God's unmerited favor. As Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10 tell us, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained, that we should walk in them. This verse says that we're actually God's workmanship, in Greek, poema, which means you're actually God's poetry, your new creation, when you're in Christ Jesus. Let's go back to the example of Mary Magdalene. In Christ, she was also given a new spiritual identity. We read of how she demonstrated this new identity as a child of God by her devotion to Christ. Mary was part of the book, for example, that financially supported our Lord's ministry and sometimes traveled with the Lord and his disciples. She was with the party that accompanied Christ on his final trip to Jerusalem, was part of the small group that actually witnessed the drastic scene of the cross when our Lord Jesus died for us. And she and the women saw the burial place of our Lord. Mary's testimony also included her visit to the empty tomb on Easter Sunday morning, 
her witness to the discouraged disciples, and finally her personal meeting with the risen Christ at the garden tomb. Remember that scene where the Lord turns to her and says, Mary, and she falls at his feet, worshiping him, Rabboni, my teacher. And that tender scene of her identifying herself as the Lord's disciple in that way. Well, you and I have the same choice. We can live in the shadows of our old identity, which maybe others have assigned to us, or we have uh, interpreted through our life's experiences, or we can accept by faith our new identity, which is the gift of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17, you remember, says, Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This new identity will be the subject of our next lesson. But at this time, as we go into uh, the second lesson together, we will see more clearly the need for a new identity due to our connection with Adam. So if you're doing this study and are not sure that Christ is in you, that you're on your way to heaven, pay close attention in this lesson to the gospel message. Now the Bible teaches not only the bad news of being lost, but also the good news of God's love for you in the finished work of Christ. There's also a sample prayer that you could pray as a guideline to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. So God bless you now as you discuss the bad news, but also especially the good news of salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ.